So welcome everyone. Today's webinar is called Resident HEPA Filter Programs, Community Solutions for Creating Clean Air. We're so excited to have you here today. This presentation is hosted by the Fire Adapted Communities Learning Network and the Western Region of the Wildland Fire Leadership Council. The Fire Adapted Communities Learning Network, or FACNET for short, is a nationwide community of wildfire adaptation practitioners supported by the partnership among the United States Forest Service, the Department of the Interior, the Nature Conservancy, and the Watershed Research and Training Center. The Western Region of the Wildland Fire Leadership Council, or WIFLIC for short, is a multi-stakeholder organization that focuses on facilitating and accelerating the implementation of the cohesive strategy across the West. One of the current priorities of WIFLIC is improving smoke readiness in communities. Good morning. My name is Allie Lurch, and I will be the moderator for today's webinar. I'm moderating from Salida, Colorado, and would like to acknowledge the original inhabitants of the Arkansas River Valley, the Ute and Apache tribes. Please take a moment to honor the ancestral grounds that we all live on and celebrate the resilience and strength that all indigenous people have shown worldwide. Thank you. I also wanna take a moment to introduce the staff that is supporting me today during this webinar. Uh, from FACNET, we have Emily Triosi, Annie Schmidt, and Maddie Smith. We also have the coordinator of the West Region of the Wildland Fire Leadership Council, Kate Lighthall. This webinar will be made available on FACNET's YouTube channel and the Western Region of the Wildland Fire Leadership Council's website within a week from today. In addition, a blog post, resources handout, and video links will be made available to the public on the FACNET blog after June 2021. If participants on the webinar are interested in joining FACNET's affiliate network, membership will open up after FACNET's new website goes live in just a few days on April 9th. Before we begin, I'd like to set some expectations for today's webinar. I just want to acknowledge that we're all living in a particularly politically charged environment and care must be taken to maintain a welcoming, safe and productive learning environment. So thank you all for being here and participating in this learning together. Today, we have the opportunity to hear from four knowledgeable wildfire practitioners and public health specialists, all helping to advance our understanding of creating clean air during wildfire and prescribed fire events. This webinar, Resident HEPA Filter Programs, Community Solutions for Creating Clean Air, is the first of our planned engagement opportunities to learn about preparing your community for smoke. Here's a layout for today's webinar. We appreciate your attendance and ask, you stay, ask that you stay through the entirety of today's event. There will be an opportunity at the end to provide ideas for additional learning topics for future learning events. So before we begin, I'm definitely one that does not like to have a lot of acronyms on the screen. And so I'd like to define HEPA filter before uh, we start the presentation. HEPA stands for High Efficiency Particulate Air Filter. And the definition is being, using, or containing a filter, usually designed to remove 99.7% of airborne particles measuring 0.3 micrometers or greater in diameter passing through it. Thank you all for registering for this webinar and for telling us a little bit about yourself and whether smoke has impacted your communities. 75% of webinar registrants answered that smoke has impacted their community. 
The topic of community smoke adaptation is so important because prolonged smoke exposure can cause physical and mental health problems, especially for smoke sensitive groups. In addition, many groups live and work outdoors in the summer and smoke seasons. Community solutions for creating clean air goes beyond housed resident needs and extends to creating solutions that protect the entire community. We will dive deeper into this during our time together today. And now it's time to meet our four panelists. Each panelist has five minutes to present on their programs and their organizations. And our first panelist is Eitan Kresilovsky with the Forest Stewards Guild. Yeah, uh, thanks, Ali. Um, so I'm with the Forest Stewards Guild. I'm based in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and that's where I'm, I'm zooming in from. And I'm gonna briefly describe two efforts that I've been involved in uh, for Central and Northern New Mexico. I wanna first thank the hard work of Sam Barry, my coworker at the Guild, uh, who did a lot of the legwork uh, to make these two programs exist. I also want to recognize the strong support from Porfirio Chavarria with the city of Santa Fe, New Mexico's Wildland Division. Everyone at uh, the National FAC Network, the Watershed Center, and Dr. Doug Cram from New Mexico State University Extension Service for supporting and investing in this program, or I should say both programs. Um, and I'd also like to point folks to a great um, a blog post on the FACnet website that Sam Berry wrote last year that describes the, these two efforts um, with pictures and, and other things. You can, you can dig deeper into that. Uh, so next slide, please. Thanks. So um, uh, this, this all started in the Greater Santa Fe Fireshed Coalition Landscape, which is a 200,000 acre landscape around Santa Fe, New Mexico after Porfirio and I learned about the Karuk tribe from Northern California, their um, air, uh, clean air program that is run out of their medical clinic. So, uh, you know, having lived and worked in Santa Fe for almost 20 years now, I know that Santa Fe has smoke sensitive individuals and that smoke from prescribed burning in the municipal watershed and other nearby areas is a hardship for them um, when the smoke does settle. Uh, into populated areas and that air cleaners might provide uh, meaningful relief. So uh, these are just two screenshots from the coalition's webpage. Uh, we also have an additional uh, webpage just devoted to general information about uh, wildfire smoke. Uh, I should say we loan out these uh, units and, and get them back and clean them and then loan them out again. Uh, and uh, next slide, Ali, please. Thanks. Uh, we have 28 units, so this is really small scale, um, and that's for the for both the coalition landscape and the fire adapted New Mexico program. And here uh, you can see on the slide, fire adapted New Mexico learning network has a similar smoke page, and people can find information about smoke and also how to access filters. Um, so. Uh, even though this was originally intended for prescribed fire, we did, uh, well, we have always loaned them out on wildfire incidents when it, when it made sense, when we could get the units to the place that was being impacted. We've sent um, several of the filter units to Durango or to Picaris Pueblo or other areas. Um, a real success uh, when we felt like we gained traction was when the Santa Fe and Carson National Forest public information officers started including information about their programs and their news releases for a while then prescribed fire. Um, uh, the filters in Santa Fe are, are housed uh, at the Forest Stewards Guild office uh, throughout northern New Mexico. We have caches, of, small caches of these uh, units at Forest Service Ranger districts, state forestry, uh, district offices, some municipal fire departments, and we also have a few filters connected to the New Mexico Prescribed Fire Council uh, trailer, which is a trailer of gear loaned out for to assist people with prescribed fires. Um, so just um, wrapping this up, because I know we have other really great presentations coming up, but um, 
in 2020, there was a fire uh, near Santa Fe called the Medio Fire. And it coincided with a slow moving low pressure system that uh, kept a lot of smoke in Santa Fe. And um, we pulled all the, the air cleaner units from Northern New Mexico to try to bring them to this landscape to put them to use. And um, we loaned them all out. Um, and I kept a wait list and we still had 50 to 60 people on the wait list that were trying to um, get some of these units to give them some clean air relief. Um, but while this was happening, there was a, a local woman and indigenous led NGO called the Three Sisters Collective uh, that um, fundraised and mobilized over 50 units to place in uh, uh, communities with tribal elders in them and they also um, built another 50 DIY units um, and uh, got them to people that needed them. And I was really impressed with that. And uh, since then, uh, I've reached out to them, or the Guild has reached out to them, and we're working with them, trying to secure more funding to, uh, to get more air cleaner units uh, into uh, tribal communities uh, uh, in the next year and also do some workshops about building DIY units um, just because we're trying to make the, the limited funds we hope to get go as far as possible. So that's just a brief snapshot of uh, the two efforts happening in Northern New Mexico. Hopefully I'm not out of time or didn't go over. Thank you, Eitan, that was perfect. Our next panelist is Katie Gibble with Ashland Fire and Rescue. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Katie Gibble. I'm the Fire Adapted Communities Coordinator for the City of Ashland. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar, Ashland is located in Southwest Oregon near the California border. Uh, the city has a really rich history in preparing for smoke um, that keeps growing annually. And so we're, I'm excited to be here sharing about our program today. Um, early smoke preparedness efforts in the city revolved around short periods of smoke that were being produced uh, from prescribed fire as part of a decades long uh, forest restoration work in the watershed above town uh, that had multiple goals, um, including the risk of large scale wildfires, uh, uh, restoring healthy forest ecosystems pr to protect uh, and to protect Ashland's drinking water source. And part of the solution to restoring these forests is prescribed fire. Um, but when smoke from these fires uh, settled into town in the evenings in particular, um, they create short periods of smoke that are not good for our residents' health, particularly our most smoke vulnerable residents. But the fire department wasn't the only one thinking about this. Um, the Chamber of Commerce locally here understood the importance of smoke, but also recognized um, the unintended impacts that smoke may have on our very visitor-based economy, um, particularly related to the Oregon Shakespeare Festival, which uh, brings in over 350,000 vi visitors annually. And with an open air theater, um, there was an obvious overlap between uh, smoke and the economy that needed to be addressed. Uh, so next slide, Allie. So like in many cases, partnership was the solution. Um, the Chamber of Commerce, uh, Ashland Fire and Rescue, Jackson County Health and Human Services, our local hospital system, Asante, uh, Southern Oregon University, and several other partners gathered together to start the uh, Chamber of Commerce Fire Task Force, uh, which has been extremely vital to the success of outreach uh, to our community around smoke. Uh, the group historically meets monthly and uh, provides a shared platform to support prescribed burning messaging, tackling smoke and health issues head on, and providing honest messaging to tourists, all in a shared environment where we're learning from each other and working together to provide the best solutions. And the end results of this partnership have been very fruitful. Um, a few highlighted here in this slide um, include uh, a few years ago, we put on a smoke preparedness workshop uh, catered towards helping businesses pre prepare for periods of smoke. Um, also, a big culmination of all this work has been the creation of smokewiseashland.org, um, which is our one-stop shop for smoke preparedness um, for our community and residents, um, as well as information about how, how uh, smoke impacts your health. 
which is a common question that we get when there's smoke in the air. Um, and we also have a text notification system that informs residents about prescribed fire and the potential smoke that may come from it, which not only helps us here in the fire department when we get calls of people asking, hey, where's the smoke coming from, uh, but also provides a platform, platform for us to educate residents about what they may be needing to do when there is smoke in the air. Um, next slide, Allie. <clears throat> And the success of this program, of which I've only highlighted a few um, successes, um, has allowed us opportunities to be successful in grant applications to boost and build our smoke-related programs. Um, so this time last year, um, the Oregon Department of Environmental Quality offered a grant opportunity uh, for communities throughout the state um, to initiate a pilot program to help residents prepare for smoke. The city of Ashland being successful in our past programs uh, ended up being successful in applying and receiving $85,000 to help our most smoke vulnerable residents prepare for times of smoke. And in Ashland, we had one mission for these funds, which was do the most good for the greatest number of people. And since in Ashland, we anticipate smoke annually, not only through both short periods of prescribed fire, uh, but in more recent years, prolonged periods of wildfire smoke Doing the most good for the most people meant identifying our most smoke vulnerable residents and giving them air purifiers to keep, recognizing that if we offered a loan program instead, we'd just be loaning out our purifiers to the same people every year. Uh, to date, we've distributed 600 purifiers in our community uh, to our most smoke vulnerable residents who we identified through an application process um, that I'm happy to share more information on. Um, and we also have large eight standalone air purifiers to distribute to larger spaces in the event of smoke events. Um, two of those are currently staged at our local homeless shelter, uh, ready to use in the event of smoke. Um, so that's just a, a highlight of our programs and I'm, I'm excited to dig into the Q&A for more details. Thank you, Katie. Our next panelist is Chris Ray with the Confederated Tribes of the Colville Reservation. Hi, everybody. Yeah, I am the air quality manager, a program manager for the Confederated Tribes of Colville Reservation. We're in north central Washington. Um, the reservation is 1.4 million acres, and three quarters of that is forested, and the rest is pretty much shrub steppe. So we're prone to having fires uh, locally. Plus, where we're located, we seem to get a lot of uh, smoke from other sources, including Siberia and, of course, California and Oregon last year. So what I do a lot is talk about smoke and becoming smoke ready because smoke is the most important air quality issue we face. Uh, it's the biggest hazard air quality wise to our health. And so we, we uh, do a lot of work for that. Next slide, please. So we, in uh, a couple of years ago, we produced a, a video um, with the uh, shown on the top left there uh, about constructing a um, your own box fan filter, uh, furnace filter configuration using two filters or one filter, and uh, we had uh, Camino Pino from our language department do the demonstration and and talk about how to put those units together and quite a bit more about why. The units are effective and air quality issues on, on top of that. Um, we also produce a fact sheet to cover um, that information too. And I'll put the link to that in the um, chat box here after, after this presentation. So that, that's been a bit really popular video. It takes about, it's about a five minute video. On the top right is a manufactured unit that, um, is always best to use because it's made for purpose. It's made to run 24 hours a day. It's uh, very efficient. They're rated by room size. And so the larger the unit, the more it's gonna cost. And also when you look at these for purchase for your program or for yourself, look at the cost of the replacement filters because they, those range greatly in, um, and add to the yearly cost of your program. Uh, the bottom left picture is an air conditioning unit uh, with two filters on it. And it's important to check those 
before smoke season or smoke events come into your area to make sure your filters are there. Also recommend that you buy the filters ahead of time before fire season or before the smoke season in your area, because as soon as that hits, people are, are purchasing those great quantities to use in the box and filters that uh, we also promote. Uh, so yeah, get your supply now <laughs> before it all runs out. Also, um, we have smoke season and it's also very hot. And many of our homes do not have air conditioning uh, built into it. So you can buy the uh, standalone room air conditioners uh, shown in the bottom right there, um, which also vents to the outside. So these unit, units produce heat. So you vent the heat to the outside. And because all the recommendations for high smoke concentrations say to stay indoors, um, a lot of times with these smoke events, there are 24 hours. So you don't have an opportunity to cool your house down at night like you would normally. Next slide, please. Also, we do a lot of work with N95 masks and dis distributing those. Um, picture on the top left is part of a fact sh uh, sheet we give out to everybody when we um, distribute masks across the reservation. They're very important to, for people to actually wear them correctly and to get the most health benefits out of that. The uh, other picture there, the black, black mask is a um, cloth outer shell with a N95 filter in there and there's a valve on it for when you exhale. And these, these I like these the best because it takes half the work out of using a mask for um, filtering the smoke out and protecting your health. And also these masks aren't suitable for the healthcare industry, so they're still available and you won't um, take, take away from the people that need it for the COVID. The bottom left picture is a um, HEPA filter in a vehicle. Now these are in the um, cab of your vehicle, so uh, they filter the air through your air conditioning unit. And it's important to make sure you check those every um, before wildfire season or before your, your smoke events, because if they're all clogged up, then they're not going to be helping you any and they'll get uh, worse and it'll affect your air conditioning unit in your vehicle. And also uh, be aware that it takes maybe up to 20 minutes to clear your vehicle using these HEPA filters um, of the smoke in there. So you may want to use your mask um, during that time period. And the masks are also good for the short events, like going out and walk your dog, getting your mail, and uh, just, to, just to protect your health on that. Um, there's some references there for some uh, more instructions from different sources for the um, DIY air filter, box fan filters. But just be aware the filters are only one of the strategies that you can help uh, yourself, your family, and your communities to minimize your exposure to smoke and protect your health over the long term. And so to become smoke ready takes a lot of work and a lot of time and a lot of strategies. Thanks. Thank you, Chris. Our final presenter is Sarah Cofield with Missoula City County Health Department. All right, thank you so much. And I'm going to apologize if it gets loud. There's leaf blowers that just decided to start outside my door. So um, they're slowly going away. Um, I am an air quality specialist at the Missoula City County Health Department. If you aren't really sure on Montana geography, uh, Missoula is um, on the western edge of the state, right up next to Idaho. Uh, we have about 100,000 people in the county um, and only two of us who do air quality for the health department, so we're a little bit busy. Uh, we get uh, smoke from our own fires uh, because we have a lot of forests. We get smoke from Idaho fires, Washington fires, Oregon fires, and California fires. Uh, so, you know, it's not a real smoke party until Washington joins the mix is one of my kind of go-tos. We get really smoked out by Washington a fair bit. Uh, and Starting in um, about 2015, 2016, started getting really interested in uh, doing more to protect our public from wildfire smoke events. And uh, we really kind of started hit the ground running in uh, 2017, which is when that photo 
is from, um, that was our worst year. There's certainly other communities have had terrible years since then, but 2017 sends out as our worst year. Um, so you can go to the next slide. I'm gonna be really just talking about our portable air cleaner cache. Um, at the health department, I have a cache of 125 air cleaners that um, I got through um, a grant that I applied for following the 2017 fires, but also we purchased about half of them during the fires using public health emergency preparedness funds. And that's a grant that the state doles out to health departments. It's usually used to pay for things like food preparation. Um, and we just emptied it about air cleaners because the fires in 2017 were so terrible. Um, it is a loaner program, um, so I loan them out and then get them back. Uh, in 2017, our focus was really on rural elementary schools. Um, we had, you, know, you could see the smoke inside the classrooms and we can see the air. You know that's bad air and you could see it inside. Um, so we bought as many as we could and got them out into classrooms. And then um, after that, we decided to really make sure our focus stayed on really young people um, because uh, a lot of science is showing that when um, young children are exposed to wildfire smoke, it can have some pretty severe impacts. Um, we see really big increases in hospital admissions for asthma complaints and respiratory uh, issues in that um, zero to one and zero to four age range. And then uh, there's also just some evidence that it can have lasting impacts because those lungs are still developing and um, being impacted by that particulate matter and all the crud that's in it in wildfire smoke is really bad for them. So we wanted to get the most bang for our buck. And so to do that, we put our air cleaners into daycares and preschools where you have kids um, from multiple families, multiple areas in one space, and they all get clean air while they are there. Um, and, and just kind of a way to really target a sensitive population um, and, and get them cleaner as best we can. And then um, we keep some on reserve in case um, another school gets hit really, really hard uh, from, from a fire. Uh, so you can go to the next slide. Um, Everything that I do is really in partnership with Climate Smart Missoula, which is the nonprofit that um, I work with uh, so much on wildfire smoke work. Uh, they host the survey form that we have for daycares and preschools to fill out. Um, we get the uh, partner with Ch Missoula Child Care Resources to let the daycares and child cares know that we're doing this. Um, and then um, Climate Smart actually hosts the form that they fill out. Uh, and then we go through all the requests for filters um, and, then, and our registration form is things like, how many rooms do you have? How large are the rooms? How many kids do you have? We find out how many air cleaners each facility needs. Um, for the small ones, Climate Smart, because they also have a cache, they just give theirs away. They're like, here you go. Um, for, I take the larger facilities that have um, bigger square footage, more rooms, more need, um, and I loan them air cleaners. Uh, and we've been doing this for a few years now. Um, and uh, we're kind of, you know, it ebbs and flows, the interest that we see kind of based on how much smoke we have on a given year. Uh, but everything is, is that I do is with Climate Smart because they're, they're an amazing group, although they're starting to kind of want to get back into being way more policy focused than strictly intervention focused. Um, so we can go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, so everything that we do is obviously much easier to accomplish with partners. Um, Climate Smart actually initiated what we're doing. Um, they came to me, Amy Sillenberg, the executive director in 2015 or 2016 and said, hey, Sarah, I'm a new nonprofit in town. I wanna to do work with wildfire smoke. Like, what can I do for you? Like, what can we do together? And I told her, you know, I want to get air cleaners to people, but it seems so big. Like it's such a hard problem. Like how do you start it? How do you fund it? How do you decide who gets it? How do you do the logistics of it? And it just was seemed really overwhelming. And then Amy came back uh, next year and she said, hey, Sarah, I have grant money. Let's do this. Um, so our initial pilot program that we started in 2017 was to um, partner with Missoula Aging Services and their Meals on Wheels program to identify um, homebound seniors with respiratory problems and get them air cleaners because we wanted to keep them out of the hospital in case smoke arrived. And then smoke did arrive and we had to really ramp up because it was a, just a cataclysmic smoke year for us. And um, we started getting money anywhere we could to frantically buy air cleaners and get them to clinic patients up in CD Lake, which was hit really hard, get them to elementary schools, get them to people who needed them. Um, and so 
Climate Smart Missoula has their own cash because they've also gotten some of the grant money um, and they give theirs away to individuals, um, high risk um, families and children um, and also some specific classrooms with kids with like cystic fibrosis and, and things like that. We want to make sure those kids always have clean air. Um, so we, we really work together on all this. And we also do a lot of wildfire smoke outreach. Um, MontanaWildfireSmoke.org is the website that we have um, that Climate Smart hosts. Um, and it has just so much information on how to prepare for wildfire smoke. That's MontanaWildfireSmoke.org. Um, and it creates information for everybody on a lot of different um, areas of preparing for wildfire smoke. And then, um, like I said, we can't just figure out who to give these to like, and, and interface with everyone who needs them. So we find organizations who are already interfacing with the communities we want to help, and they help us with the outreach and, and getting in touch with those people. So um, Missoula Child Care Resources um, has the contact information for all the daycares and preschools in, in the county. So we partnered with them to get that information out that, hey, we have this program. Missoula Aging Services has our Meals on Wheels program. They're actually going into the homes of um, the vulnerable elderly residents. And um, that was our initial pilot project. They've continued to work with Climate Smart over the years to identify specific individuals who would really benefit. Um, and they also distribute um, educational material for us. So like last year, we made a senior specific smoke ready pamphlet um, that they distributed to it for us through their programs. Um, so that's what I've got and I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Sarah. And thank you to all the panelists. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now and we're gonna spotlight the panelists and begin our discussion. So I'm gonna allow that to happen for just a few seconds. Excellent. Well, we're gonna begin the panel discussion now and our discussion has three themes. And the first theme is based off of really initiating a program, starting from fresh, how do we do this? And so our first question is, which HEPA filters are most effective for wildfire smoke? Which are best suited for a community loan program? What's better, a rent or to own program? Each panelist has two minutes to answer the question. And we will start with Katie. Yeah, that's um, a really good question um, that we debated a lot um, upon receiving the, the grant dollars that we did to distribute um, air purifiers. And um, for us, just recognizing that um, we were going to be experiencing smoke not only during a prescribed fire season, but more and more frequently um, prolonged periods of wildfire smoke from the region are occurring and rolling into the valley on an annual basis. Um, we knew that if we went with a, uh, a loan program that the same people would be asking for these uh, HEPA filters. And so for us, a loan to keep um, was definitely um, the solution. So I'll, I'll highlight that, that portion of the answer. Thank you, Katie. Sarah? Yes, so there's multiple parts to that question. Um, the question of which HEPA filter to use, and by that you mean which portable air cleaner to use, um, you know, it's really kind of up to you. We use the Winix air cleaners because when we started our pilot project, they're the only company that offered us a discount. Um, and so that's what we bought. And we've continued to use them um, for because uh, they've, they've kept up good relationship, but also. Uh, by only having one kind and using one kind of filter, because I have a cash where I replace those HEPA filters, I only have to buy one kind of HEPA filter. I don't have to think about it um, for replacing the filter in those machines. So I, I, they're all use the same exact model of HEPA filter inside those Winix air cleaners. Um, so you want to, the, the questions you really want to ask yourself are how much space do you want to clean? How loud of a machine are you willing to tolerate? Um, how is it using a true HEPA filter and how well does that HEPA filter sit in the machine? Um, there's just a lot of things to think about, but um, it, it, there's no specific brand that really is, is gonna be like, yeah, I use that brand. And also I work in government, so I can't, I can't advertise the specific brand. So um, just use some parameters for what you're thinking about. 
Um, and then on the loan or keep for individuals, definitely I think it's best to give them things to keep. Um, for loaning, um, it's, it's a huge logistical nightmare. I don't like doing it, um, but there have been some benefits um, I don't have to worry about. Are people replacing their HEPA filter because I do it when I get the machines back? Um, several of the, of the facilities I've helped have bought their own air cleaners because they like them so much. And then I was able to loan mine to other people um, because uh, there was other people took care of themselves. Um, so for, loan, for facilities, I think loaning is okay, but you have to store them, you have to clean them, you have to track them, and I don't like doing it, but I do it. Um, for individuals, I really think just give them an air cleaner so they have a clean air resource, um, and that's, that's what I got. Thank you both. And I just want to mention, um, Annie put in the chat, thank you to everyone uh, who put, who asked some questions uh, during the registration phase. The questions that we are going through with the panelists are questions from you all. So our next question is, which partners make the best collaborators with these types of programs? And let's start with Eitan. Yeah, that's a, that's a I like this question. Uh, I think it's important because uh, I've, I've learned a lot since we started this. Uh, four years ago or so, and some of the partners uh, that that um, we started with um, uh, were the were the right well, right ones at the time, but uh, we we need more partners. And so, it just just earlier this morning, I was talking with Santa Fe County about this issue uh, local to the Greater Santa Fe Fireshed Coalition landscape, and. Um, you know, they're interested in partnering and uh, learning about some of these other models that were discussed uh, this this morning just a few minutes ago and thinking about how they can uh, be part of this solution because a small, you know, seven, seven person in my Santa Fe office when we all show up in the office is not enough people or space to meet the need for clean air in this community is just one example. So yeah, you need you need partners. Also, the Three Sisters Collective is an example of a partner that we didn't know about when we started, but we probably should have learned about them a couple of years ago and we'd be farther along in providing uh, clean air solutions to people. Thank you, Eitan. How about Chris? Yeah. We like to partner with everybody we can. Uh, on the reservation, we partner with all our uh, tribal health programs, which there's a, a few of those, including mental health. Um, we partner with our low income energy assistance programs because they, ha they have the clients and they have the distributions. Uh, emergency service is also a big partner of ours for mass distribution and uh, getting information out. And then off the reservation, we form the uh, help form the Okanagan River Airshed Partnership because the airshed is comprised of both on and off reservation people, and we wanted to make a difference there on the uh, protecting people from smoke in that area. And that's been really helpful to get all those different partners in on that. Um, we also off reservation we we partner with the community action for the county, the county health districts and the cities in, in those. Um, and I, I suggest getting as many partners as you want because uh, we're all small programs and we don't have all the expertise to run something as massive as this. Like Sarah was saying, it takes a lot of work just to buy the, the filters. And so uh, partner with everybody. And our federal partner is EPA because that's where my funding comes from, from the program. Thanks. Thank you, Chris. Why don't we head over to Sarah? Thank you. Um, well, obviously nonprofits are great to partner with. Um, when small, nice thing about that, I can't recommend an air cleaner brand, but nonprofits sure can. So I direct people to Climate Smart. Um, and they also have ties in the community that I might not see in, in my government office. Um, we partner obviously with organizations that interface directly with the communities that we're really interested in. Um, so like yesterday, Amy from Climate Smart and I, we had a really nice meeting with the United Way of Missoula County so, to talk about what more we could do for our unhoused population in Missoula County. Um, it's really trying to find those organizations that are interfacing with the people that, that you are interested in, in, in working with um, because 
can't do it by yourself. You've got to have partners um, helping. It also helps for grant applications to so that you have all these people you're working with. Um, we, when the heat of it, when we were frantically buying air cleaners um, in 2017, I'm united with Missoula County stepped up and um, helped pay for some air cleaners because Amy just put them on her credit card with the assumption that she would get funding eventually from somebody to help pay for it. Um, and then uh, local community foundations have provided some grant funding um, to help purchase air cleaners um, in our communities and also other communities in Western Montana. Um, and oh, and the American Lung Association actually did some work uh, in 2017 getting air cleaners to people as well. So I uh, definitely, partners are great. I love nonprofits because they are really invested in helping the community. Um, so, yeah. Thank you, Sarah. And last, Katie. Yeah, Sarah did a good job highlighting um, a lot of the groups I was going to mention. For us, as far as getting these purifiers into the hands of the people that need it most, it requires partnering um, with the representatives of those various uh, vulnerable populations. So um, in Ashland, we have a large um, over 65 community. So that involved connecting uh, with a lot of our extended care facilities um, and retirement centers, um, as well as our um, city run senior center. Um, and we also connected to get to these air purifiers to children, particularly under the age of 15, we were able to connect with um, our local school system uh, to get those applications out to um, the parents of those students that might be vulnerable to smoke. Um, and of course, our local hospital system, uh, they are able to provide uh, direct connections between their doctors and this uh, smoke purifier program. We had a lot of applicants coming directly from folks that doctors referred to this program. So connecting with those folks that are the touch points between who needs the purifiers most and um, who is the trusted voice in those individual communities, it's really important to build those relationships. And um, luckily we've, uh, we've been working on those for a while. So there's a lot of trust uh, built between us. Thank you all. I know we've mentioned tribal uh, partnerships and communities in that last question, but can we dive a little bit deeper into uh, partnerships that do exist and start with Chris? Yeah, fortunately, tribal air programs across the nation have a, a great network of support through the National Tribal Air Association and the Tribal Air Monitoring Support uh, Center. So we, we have if I have a question about anything, I can just call somebody up from somewhere across the nation that's done that kind of work and get guidance on that. So that's been really helpful. Um, we also get technical support from EPA and a lot of other support on how to do things um, from the region and national level also. So um, yeah, I have no problem finding um, support through the tribal communities and networks. Thanks. Thank you, Chris. And Aton? Yeah, uh, the, the partners, uh, you know, the, the my organization, the Foresters Guild, has been based in, uh, in Santa Fe for going back 30 years or so. So we do have connections, and those connections did allow us to, um, you know, to, to kind of get the, the, ca the small caches of air cleaners stationed in different communities uh, around northern New Mexico. And so that we used basically our network to make that happen. Um, but uh, like everyone's been saying on the panel, um, th there's more networking and partnerships to do to, to build and expand this work. Thank you. So next question, and you all are so great at answering that we do have a little overlap. So, um, and, I, and I've heard some funding sources uh, for equipment, but this one dives in just a little bit deeper too, not just with equipment. So, so what are funding sources for equipment, administrative supports and low income residents? And taking it a little bit further, do you feel that there is a gap um, in funding these programs? Let's start with Sarah. Thanks, and just, just as the leaf floors came in. Um, so initially we got funding um, through 
a grant from um, local hospitals for our initial pilot project. They had a little bit of money for community health projects. Um, and then, like I said, we emptied our public health emergency preparedness fund, which is a grant from the state to local health departments. I'm not in emer emergency preparedness for the health department, so I don't know how all that worked. I think that our health officer just said, we're taking this money and we're buying air cleaners. Um, and uh, then the rest of my money came from the Montana Disaster Relief Foundation that was established following the 2017 fires. Since then, I have failed to get every grant I've applied for. Um, I've applied for EPA grants and FEMA grants, um, Robert Ford Johnson Foundation grant. Um, we applied for uh, the nonprofit I work with, applied for some COVID money grant because, hey, it's an overlap, wildfire, smoke, and COVID, like you need air cleaners. Um, we have not been able to get grant money since then. Um, and it's been very, very, very frustrating, which, so on the one hand, it is good to have loaners because I still have them and I stocked up on enough HEPA filters that I'm, I'm set for a little while. Um, but it's, there isn't money. There's not a dedicated funding source. It's all competitive grants, um, which is my biggest, one of my high horses to get on. Um, so there's a huge gap. It is not a recognized need at the state level. Um, we don't get funding for this program. There's not a, there's not a dedicated funding source for clean air. Um, so it's all just fighting for grants. Um, some community foundations, you know, on a piece by piece, if you have a community foundation that's really active, hit them up. Um, but it's really piecemeal. Thank you, Sarah. And Eitan. Yeah, I have a similar experience to what Sarah described. We got some seed funding from the, the partners I mentioned through the City of Santa Fe, the Fire Debt to Communities Network, New Mexico State University Extension. Uh, this was the, you know, back with the main focus of prescribed fire, not thinking about bigger, more prolonged wildfire events, um, which, you know, uh, we're experiencing in New Mexico too. Um, and, uh, the, the funding was for the equipment uh, for the similar to what the pictures and what was described, we happen to also get Winix units. And so similar to the Winix units, or the funding was for those units, not for admin um, or program design, uh, which, you know, no knock against our funders, we were able to put something small together that I think really does help the people that access them, but um, we're not necessarily, um, reaching the right populations and to be, you know, to admit to that. And um, and we don't have enough funding to really run it. Um, and so uh, we've applied for some grants, like Sarah said, and not gotten them, and but we're applying for more and hopefully we'll get some. Uh, and I'm hopeful that um, uh, others, other partners through our networks can, can help um, build what we have started here um, to make it more long lasting and more beneficial. Thank you both. Really highlighting the partnerships um, aspect of this and to the success of these programs. The last question in our first theme is, how do you ensure that people who receive filters through a free distribution program are replacing the filters annually? Uh, and let's start with Katie. This is a really good question and one that needs to be thought about. So we sort of thought about this question uh, as we were selecting which purifier we would purchase in bulk to distribute. Um, we wanted the replacement filter to be as economical as possible. So if you've begun looking for purifiers, um, these different HEPA purifiers sort of span the spectrum of cost of the unit, but it also spans the spectrum of what's the cost of that replacement uh, HEPA filter inside. And so one of the items we analyzed when picking an air purifier was how much is that new replacement filter going to cost? Um, and so we ended up going with one of the cheapest ones, which again was the, the Winix. I've got four sitting up here. Um, so I think there's a theme going on here, but um, on top of that, we also worked with um, the manufacturer to get a discount for replacement filters upon distributing these purifiers. Um, so within the box containing the purifiers, we insert a coupon code 
uh, that people could enter to apply for a 20% discount on replacement filters and encourage those residents to purchase those right away um, because smoke was imminent at the time of distribution last summer. Um, so we helped by providing as much of a discount as we could and also thinking ahead when those purifiers are going to be replaced, um, the filters are gonna be replaced down the road. Are they going to be affordable? Because the people we distributed these purifiers to tended to be low income and were least likely to have purchased one of these purifiers in the first place. And then as a final stopgap, um, when each of these residents received a purifier, they were automatically signed up for our smoke text alert system. And so uh, we have the opportunity to reach out in bulk to these residents that received purifiers, reminding them to check their air purifier filters um, and see if they need replaced. So put a lot, put a lot of work into that question. Thank you so much, Katie. And let's round this off with Chris. Yeah, well, you, you can't guarantee people will change their filters uh, ever or on time or not, but you can provide them with the means to do that. And, and to do that, we provide the information on why it's important to change your, your air filters and also how to do it properly and when to do it. How do you tell when, when you do that? And I think, like uh, Katie was saying, give them a year's supply of filters with it when you give them the... the the whole unit. And I, I think you just provide those possibilities, then you let the people do the work. And I like checking back on them too, just to remind them, because that's, it's always good to visit too. Thanks. Thank you. And thank you all who are putting questions in the chat. We will be uh, answering those uh, after our, our themed portion of the panel discussion. So we're gonna move into smoke sensitive groups. And our first question is, how do we ensure that we're serving the most sensitive populations in our community and communicating across multiple platforms to inform resident residents about what you're offering? Uh, Sarah, do you wanna start that? Sure, uh, so this is again, those partnerships. Um, in order to uh, get to the kids, we need to interface with people who work with, with, with the children and have all the contact information to get us in touch with, with those children. Um, and then for working with the elderly, it, it's, you know, working with Missoula Aging Services uh, and getting access to their, um, to their folks that they work with. Uh, and, and, you know, we're just nascent beginning of how can we even unhouse is talking to the groups in the community who interface with that population. Um, so I, I think, you know, you can't just have something on a website and assume anybody will see it. You can have the most wonderful website in the world, but if no one knows about it, is it really there? Um, so it really is about making those direct contacts with the people who work with the community that you want to help. Um, and then obviously, you know, you have the website and you have the blog about wildfire smoke and you have the email list, and you have all these other distribution routes um, to, to get information to people. Um, but it really is about relationships. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, Katie. Yeah, Sarah really highlighted it. It's all about those partnerships with um, the, the populations you're trying to get at. So I've already spoken to that as far as, you know, these different groups who to tie, who to tie in with, but um, just following up with, with them as well. So after, after distributing all these purifiers, letting them know where the success of that program, what that meant for the communities that they served. Um, and that provides, you know, future partnership opportunities. In our case, um, we had an initial wave of purifiers that we received. Um, and then the state gave us more money to purchase more. And we didn't have to sort of rejigger that conversation with those same partners because we had kept in touch with them, um, making it easier to, um, to distribute even more um, purifiers. And as far as communicating directly to our most vulnerable residents, again, relying on those partnerships and working with the individual entities to get whatever information you're trying to get out in a way that they already do so that they're not starting from scratch, uh, whether it's like working with our senior center to get information in their monthly newsletter, you know, that requires meeting their deadlines as opposed to us pushing 
um, an agenda. You know, we're working with them instead and meeting their needs. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Katie. And last, Eitan. Yeah, so for the multiple platforms, uh, like everyone said, getting using your networks and the power of those networks is really important. Uh, I think a success for us was getting in the, the news releases for the National Forest Public Information Officers. That has, um, you know, uh, that has been really helpful, I think, because those get posted places physically. They also get emailed, sometimes get picked up by news organizations. Uh, I've also gone on uh, local radio uh, programs, talk radio programs uh, to, to connect with different audiences. And um, now at least one radio program uh, host calls me when there's smoke in the air and uh, we can talk about if all the units are loaned out or if there are some available, things like that. Um, uh, a weakness of the program I presented is that we just distribute the, the units to based on the people requested and we don't have a, uh, like a, fil a filter or a questionnaire to, to meet criteria uh, like Katie described and, and uh, I believe Sarah and Chris also described. So that's something that um, uh, if we can get some of this funding we just talked about, I'd like to you know, take a look back and, and change what we're doing. Um, to uh, to really try to get the units into the right hands, into the right houses. That's a great transition, Eitan. How, how do we determine which community members are most eligible to receive HEPA filters, especially if they have similar qualifications? Um, start off with Chris. And back to partners, and, and so you communicate with the people that you know, probably want to target. And uh, in our case, and reservations in our community, it would be the elders would be one of the prime target audiences for uh, distributions of HEPA filters in your house or our N95 mask or, or any other kind of help that we can provide. Um, and then you just start working with your partners and set the criteria, who, who gets what first and how you're going to distribute them. So it's, it's pretty straightforward, I think, um, to do that. And just the sad part is you'll never have enough. And so you won't be able to um, service the entire community. But people, people understand that. I've run quite a few different programs and they understand lack of money and who gets what when. So they're always understanding. Thanks. Thank you, Chris. Katie? Yeah, Chris definitely hit the highlights there. And we spent, uh, because we had a lot of purifiers to work with, um, we spent a lot of time thinking through that criteria of who is considered the most um, eligible to receive these purifiers. Um, and so we, we knew what it means to be a smoke vulnerable resident. It's residents that are over 65, uh, children under the age of 15, people with pre-existing heart and lung conditions, um, and sort of overlaying all of that, who is low income and would otherwise not be able to afford to buy one of these purifiers in the first place. And so um, as a group working with feedback from our task force with the chamber, uh, we established a scoring criteria for the digital application that we sent out for residents to apply for these filters. And ultimately, if a household contained people that met multiple uh, smoke vulnerable criteria, and then overlaying all of that uh, were considered in a lower income bracket, we were able to just through an Excel sheet, drag through and provide a score for each of those residents based off of how many people in their household were smoke vulnerable. So um, that was a really um, challenging and worthwhile exercise just because at the end of the day, doing a gut check of those scores, we knew that the residents that received those purifiers were indeed the most in need of them. So it's worth thinking through that when you're thinking through um, who to distribute these purifiers to. Thank you, Katie. Let's dive in really quick about messaging. Uh, what messages have worked best for you and how do you gauge the effectiveness of your messaging? And back to you, Katie. 
Yeah, our, our messaging is, um, I've already alluded to, you know, working with our individual partners on what their messaging is, whether it's through a newsletter or they send out information uh, directly to the doctors that are working with these smoke vulnerable residents um, and, uh, you know, overlaying all of that uh, residents that are interested in um, knowing when there's going to be smoke in the air and potentially receiving information on what to do when there's smoke in the air. We do have a citywide um, text alert system that sends out information when we have prescribed fires or when the air quality has shifted into the unhealthy level when you should consider doing things like closing your doors and windows. Um, gauging the effectiveness, effectiveness of that is um, a little bit more challenging, uh, as it always is the effectiveness of any program measuring the, that success. And um, for that, we really turn back to uh, relying on our partners to know that like the messages that they send out that we work with to distribute, that's the most comfortable way, <clears throat> comfortable way for them to distribute those messages. Um, so getting at that, how effective is that messaging is, is still certainly a challenge that I don't necessarily have the answer to. Thank you, Katie, and thank you for your honesty. Uh, we're going to move into uh, the last theme for our panel discussion, and which is all about evaluating the effectiveness of our programs. And so our first question is, how do you know your efforts are having the intended impact? And we're gonna start with Sarah. Thank you. Um, so the most thing we have to go on right now is, is anecdotal responses. So for example, um, of the daycares and preschools that I've, that I've loaned air cleaners to who were so happy that they bought their own, um, which indicates that they, they had a good experience and also they've given us some nice feedback um, uh, just in little written testimonies. Uh, but this then gets into the difficulty of evaluating the impact of any program because that requires research if you want to do it correctly, and that requires money, and that's a whole other category of grants that we've applied for and not gotten. Um, we have with, teamed up with the University of Montana on a, multiple grant applications to try to really study the effectiveness of the intervention programs we're doing, of the communication efforts we're doing, our people responding to what we're putting out and changing um, their behavior? Are they making, taking efforts to clean their indoor air? Are they using air cleaners? Are the ones we're giving out there being like used appropriately and effectively? Are we having good? Anyway, we haven't got any of the grant money. Um, so it's a real challenge to find out if it's being effective. Um, but we do know that creating cleaner indoor air is always a good thing. So I don't think we're causing any harm. Um, and we just, from the feedback from people that we are able to directly um, help, they're, they're always just really, really grateful. Uh, and that makes it at least feel worthwhile. Thank you, Sarah. I wanna offer to Eitan or Chris, would you also like to answer this question? Well, I mean, I, I agree that uh, academic level research would be great. I, I think practitioner level monitoring and evaluation could also be used here, uh, especially synthesis across some of these uh, examples that we're just talking about today. I'm sure there are others out there as well. Um, uh, but yeah, all that requires kind of time and money and resources, and those seem to be scarce. <laughs> I'm seeing some nodding heads. Um, but, uh, but maybe there's a way we can do some of that practitioner level monitoring and evaluation uh, while we wait for the peer review academic level evaluation. Chris, I don't want to put you on the spot, but wondered if you wanted to answer this one too. Uh, like Sarah said, you know, getting um, that information is extremely hard. Um, effectiveness of your outreach efforts or anything like that is this just takes a lot of skills to do that and research projects through universities are a, a good way to do that because they have those skills and uh, but those are competitive grants too for those those researchers so it takes a while to do that i'm hoping to uh, well i'm working with the university of washington uh, on that now thank you all and our last question, um, have communities changed their acceptance level of prescribed fire 
after receiving these filters. I'm gonna give this one to Eitan. Yeah, thanks, Ali. Um, this is, again, really hard to answer, but anecdotally, um, uh, there's a there's a few elements that that we've kind of gleaned on, and one is from Sam Berry's uh, FactNet blog post um, that every time you talk, someone calls you or emails you, or you meet them in the parking lot with masks on to deliver a to loan out a, an air cleaner unit, you can have a conversation about um, why are they why are they doing prescribed fire. Um, uh, what's up with the wildfire, you know, you can have these conversations and it's an opportunity for outreach and communication about a topic, topics that I care about a lot, which are the, the natural resource forest watershed topics. So that's an education opportunity. Um, uh, and then, uh, you know, people are, you know, often thankful, uh, you know, when you get the, the air cleaner unit into the right place, um, uh, when, you know, it, they tell you like this really helped me uh i have all these other conditions and you know getting this relief was really important um so they you know they're thankful for that and uh and there's been a few instances where you know we have repeat fires repeat prescribed fires and um and you know you you talk to people and you know you get the give out the unit give it get it back and then the next year you go back to the same place and um you know, they are just ready. It's like this is this hap prescribed fire happens annually, and it's a normal thing in this landscape. And I feel like that is some level of success for acceptance of prescribed fire. Thank you, Aton. And I know we can dive much deeper into the topic of prescribed fire, and um, maybe that would be a topic for another uh, learning uh, event. So that rounds off our um, planned panelist uh, session. We've got some great questions in the chat. And so um, Sarah, you're on board for the first one. Um, and so it's, let's talk logistics. What's a typical loan length? Do you have a user agreement? And did you purchase a storage unit to store them? And do you use an air compressor to clean? And so since that is four questions, if you want me to repeat any throughout, let me know. All right. Um, so uh, my loan length, the typically I try to get them out before the fire season starts. So typically beginning of July, although sometimes people wait until the smoke gets here to actually fill out the survey and request them. Um, so starting in the summer is when I start trying to get them out. Um, and then I put into the loan agreement, usually in November, um, because we can have smoke into October and I don't want them to feel um, rushed or pushed or, or worried. But I do have a loan agreement that is signed off on by our lawyer um, that basically says if they don't return them or if they damage them, then they have to pay to replace them. Um, and uh, I've, I've yet to actually like do that to anybody. But, um, and I'll be really honest, this year I have not really pushed to get them back because of COVID and they're serving a dual purpose. Um, and I don't, you know, if, if it's a light smoke year, I'd be like, well, I could reuse these type of filters because, you know, it's not like they're going to expire. Um, but this year with COVID, I'm going to throw out all those HEPA filters in the end anyway. So I still have several daycares and preschools that I've let them keep them way past the return date. Um, and that's just the flexibility that's built into my program because it's just me. Um, for storage, the health department actually had a little storage unit that um, we cleared out whatever random stuff was in there. And it's just wall to wall air cleaners right now. Um, I, like, I, I apply for grants, but I have nowhere to put more of them. So like, I'm kind of kind of stocked in air cleaners for the amount of space that I have. Um, and then I haven't used an air compressor to really get in there. That's not a bad idea, but um, I typically wipe them down. If you loan them out, make sure you have in the loan agreement that they will clean them before they return them to you because I didn't do that the first year and I opened up the first thing and then took off the just like just crap just dust and hair and dog fur and whatever else was in that daycare preschool came falling down onto my carpet in my office and I don't like it um so but in there that they need to clean their cleaner before they give it to you. And then you swab it down again just to be safe. But, um, you know, 
don't let them bring you a dirty air cleaner. Lesson learned. Um, but you know, I haven't used an air compressor. It's an interesting idea. Thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, so for these next questions, panelists, if uh, if I call on one of you, but someone else wants to answer, feel free and unmute after the answer and, and go ahead and um, add a response. Does anyone have a, rent, a written strategic business plan for starting an air purification distribution support plan that can be shared? Um, we are working on one. So our, um, our partners that gave us the funding at the Department of Environmental Quality requested that of with some additional grant funding. Um, we're having Sarah Jones here in the Wildfire Division coordinate with the DEQ to write um, something similar to this. So I'd be happy to distribute that to the uh, FAC network. And my hunch is that Allie would be willing to distribute that out to everyone here. So I'll, I'll share that opportunity, just recognize that it's uh, a couple months away. Anyone else? No. Okay. I should, but I don't. Well, um, thank you for that offer, Katie. And I would be uh, happy to distribute any um, documentation uh, to the, uh, at least to the registrants of this webinar um, as a follow-up as well. A next question, um, with respect to monitoring, is anyone doing a PM monitoring in the homes? Chris, do you wanna take this? Yeah, it's it's the next step for using the uh, air sensors in your home. I have a small purple air sensor network in the part of the reservation. We're going to expand that outside. Also have um, three regulatory type monitors on the reservation. So we've got we got our ambient covered pretty well, and this the inside part of it. And so we're starting a project with the Institute for Tribal Environmental Professionals to um, help educate our, some of the families through the children uh, programs on the reservation to monitor their air inside. And there's some pretty good indoor air quality monitors that have uh, particulate matter, uh, CO2 levels, humidity and temperature and things like that on there. And it, uh, I've been experimenting with some of those in a few uh, rooms and it's um, right now I'm pretty fascinated with the CO2 levels and how that fluctuates during the day and um, how high that actually gets, which is also a factor during wildfire season. So it, it's really important to eventually work through into that. Um, the indoor air monitors are under $200 mainly, and they have lights on them to show your level of uh, PM 2.5 or worse particulate matter in there. Thanks. Thank you. Next question. Can anyone speak to which air filters also filter out COVID-19? Well, it would just be any good HEPA filter. If the virus is in that size fraction that would be trapped by HEPA filter. Thank you. We had, we had several businesses ask us this question because there was this, you know, uh, discussion as COVID was unfolding, as we were stopping indoor dining, um, whether those purifiers would do any good. And the, even if HEPA filters are filtering out the virus, if you are a vector with the virus, you're constantly producing it. So there's, there's always going to be that virus in the air. Um, so even if you have a filter that filters it out, if you're constantly producing it, then you're, that doesn't stop that location with a filter from being a vector. Thank you. Next question, this is back to you, Katie. I'm curious about the Ashland smoke text alert system. Do you have a standard pre-prepared message or do you customize each time? Um, we, we have pre-prepared messages in that um, when we send out those alerts, we can just look to the one that we sent before, um, particularly speaking to when we're giving residents a heads up about potential smoke that's going to be in the air. Uh, we inform people of the location of where that smoke is going to be coming from, 
um, and provide a link to a map that shows people where that smoke is going to be. Um, if that does uh, trigger into like a smoke event, like if we have smoke settle into the valley in the evenings, uh, we will just personalize a message letting folks know when that when that comes up um, and when air quality gets poor, we just uh, we have a limited amount of space, so we don't really need to pre create messages knowing that we can't say much in the first place. Thank you, Katie. We have one more question from the chat and ap apologies. I'm not sure if this goes to Sarah or Katie. Um, there was a mention of using some part of emergency funding for public health during an incident to purchase filters. What program or line item were you able to use to purchase during or following a fire? Yeah, I think that one was um, for me. And that was, um, unfortunately, I'm not our, our FEP person. It, um, it's the Public Health Emergency Preparedness Fund um, that comes from the state health department and gets taken down to the counties um, and it lives in our emergency preparedness um, program. Um, but I wasn't involved in that funding decision of, of okay, we're gonna take this. I do know that it is typically used, like I said, for like flu response. I'm sure it was gone by May 3rd of last year um, for COVID. Uh, so I can't really answer like how specifically they, they use it. But I do know that when I was desperately trying to get money in 2017, like I was calling state, I was like, why can't you give us money? Um, they just said, use your FEP money, use your, that. Use that. Um, and they wouldn't give us anything else. So we just emptied that account. Um, and that's, that's all I know, I'm sorry. Thank you, Sarah. So we've got time for one more question and um, I want this to go to Chris. And so are DIY resources effective like yours um, with the um, at home uh, HEPA filter? Yes, I, I believe they're very effective. You, you put a Verve 13 filter on there and you configure it correctly. Um, make sure you don't hook the filter on really tight because it needs that extra airflow from the, the makeup air from the sides. And just uh, check out that video we put together with some tips on how to construct those um, well. And they, um, the only big drawback compared to the manufactured filters is they're more noisy. And when you run them on medium or high, which you have to do to get the airflow through there. So um, Fortunately, there's also some research projects going right now in the EPA, I think region nine about uh, box fan filters and, and safety issues. And so they're actually testing those out to determine how safe they are and how long you can run them. Thank you, Chris. Look forward to learning more about that. So we're rounding off the end of our webinar. I wanna th say thank you to our panelists for um, their time, expertise, and willingness to be a part of this. So uh, all panelists will have an opportunity right now to provide a reflection, and that reflection can be on any part of your SMOKE program, air quality, um, or your organization. Um, let's start uh, with Aton. Yeah, thanks, Ali. Um, I, uh, I just really appreciate uh, being, on, being a participant because I'm also a participant today, uh, kind of learning about the other, um, uh, the other efforts from uh, Chris, Katie, and Sarah, and um, uh, the links in the chat. I'm gonna save the chat um, as a file so I can uh, get those links and, and start watching the videos and checking out everyone's resources. Uh, so I think, um, you know, if I had a reflection, it was that, that this is emerging, it still seems, uh, and we need to um, we need to kind of nurture uh, uh, these efforts, uh, learn from them and, and adapt and uh, you know, try them in different areas, adapt them to different places and landscapes. Uh, and I hope um, that everyone on here, uh, you know, that we can create some sort of uh, a community of people concerned about this that are want to further uh, advance this effort to provide clean air during prescribed fire and wildfire. 
Thank you, Eitan. Sarah. Thanks. And I've, I've said this, I think, multiple times in different ways already uh, in this past hour or so. Um, I'm very frustrated that in order to do these programs, it's a competition. Um, it's going for those competitive grants. You may or may not live in a state that helps you out. Um, and public health should not be a competition. I mean, we need to get to a framework where just we as a society understands the smoke impacts are gonna continue and they are tremendously huge health impacts for our community. Just, you know, look at California, you have millions of people being impacted by smoke. You have hundreds of thousands of people in Montana being impacted by smoke and it has very detrimental to, to human health. We don't have a dedicated funding source. We don't have real programs set up in any kind of comprehensive fashion to help people be protected when these high pollution events happen. And so you're gonna have these big health inequities. You're gonna have disparity of access to health because you have people who can't afford an air cleaner or even a DIY air cleaner. You have people without air conditioning who have no option but to open their windows at night. Um, and we just, we aren't there yet. Um, and, and, and I want to get to a place where we just as a society value clean air for everyone and work on having those resources available so it's not a competition. I'm really happy when someone else gets money for their air cleaner programs, I'm, I'm happy for them, but it means I didn't get it. Um, and, and so just public health should not be a competition and that's what it is right now. Thank you so much, Sarah. Chris. Yeah. As Sarah pointed out, you know, to become smoke ready for your family, your business, or your community takes takes a lot of time. And a lot of us look to the air quality index from the EPA to get recommendations for our actions during high smoke events. And I think the, these recommendations need to be revamped because of the uh, climate change, wind driven fires that we're having nowadays. When um, we can burn up 200,000 acres in four hours with a 60 mile an hour wind. It's just um, unprecedented on, on how much smoke that puts up and how it affects our community. So with these high concentrations, I think we need to change some of those recommendations on the air quality index that you can find on air now, um, EPA site. I, um, some of the smoke episodes, you know, they, they vary from a short-term exposure to very long-term exposure. We've had exposures up in the unhealthy to a hazardous zone for two weeks in a row, 24 hour average. So once you pass a certain point in there from short to long-term, the recommendations should also change. And they're based on go inside. And so we've been talking about how to mitigate some of the, those um, effects and minimize your exposure. And there's all sorts of strategies too that we can uh, talk about, including, you know, which door to use in your house. That'll have a big effect on that too. So lastly, I'd like to see the uh, air quality index add a new category, about 500 micrograms per cubic meter, which is very, very thick smoke. It's way past the hazardous category on there and call it catastrophic and make sure that the recommendations state that you do everything possible to minimize your smoke exposure, including evacuation. And a subcategory of the catastrophic is if you're downwind from a town burning, which happens very regularly. Um, we've had fire into seven of our communities on the reservation and the county in the past five years. So you need recommendations for what to do when you're downwind from that uh, talent's burning. Thanks. Thank you, Chris. And, and finally, Katie. Yeah, I'll loop, I'll loop around what Aton alluded to, which is that, you know, smoke is an emerging issue. More and more partners that I work with nationally are thinking about smoke. Um, in, in their place. And, and so, you know, tying back to the conversation that kept coming up today is that um, building, building partnerships with other people that are recognizing this emerging issue is, is going to be critical. Here, here in Ashland, we're really fortunate that um, 
we're not the only one thinking about smoke. So it wasn't just an emerging issue for us when we began uh, setting out to meet this challenge. Um, so as in your place and your community, as smoke becomes more emergent, um, just partnering up with the people that are also concerned about um, protecting citizens' uh, citizens' health um, from smoke will will help you move faster and move mountains uh, more easily together. So I'll I'll leave it at that. Thank you all. I'm going to share my screen once more uh, to do an appropriate thank you to all of our panelists. Um, you'll see their email information is on this screen. And this is an opportunity for you as um, participants uh, to put some more learning ideas into the chat. And so if you can, if this webinar um, inspired you to want to learn more or gain more knowledge on any part of SMOKE uh, community programs and filter programs, please feel free right now to type into the chat those ideas. Um, we'll, we'll filter through those and uh, come up with uh, a next learning topic that we can all be on this together. Besides the panelists, I also wanna acknowledge um, our sponsors, the Fire Adapted Communities Learning Network and the Western Region of the Wildland Fire Leadership Council. This recording uh, will be posted on WIFLIC website and on the Fire Adapted Community Network's YouTube channel, uh, most likely within the week. I thank you all so much for your time today and be well. <laughs>